Welcome everyone, thank you so much for being here today uh, for a very special guest speaker who I'm extremely excited and eager to introduce to you. And I want you to have as much time as possible with this speaker, so I'll make this brief. Uh, but let me say our speaker graduated from the Department of Journalism and the Harrington School of Communication and Media here at the University of Rhode Island in 1999. We have such incredible teachers here that it's very common that students will remember their teachers for many years after they graduate, and they'll remember the influence that their teachers have had on them. Less likely, though, are when teachers finally remember their students 15 and 20 years after they graduate. But that is exactly the case with our speaker today because he's such an intelligent, bright, ambitious, and kind person that he made this indelible mark on the university and on the faculty at this university and that even today they speak of him fondly. And when we were in my office, just half an hour ago, one of his former professors from 15, 16 years ago came down and he says, I remember this story you wrote in my class 15 years ago. And that's remarkable, right? Most of us don't remember what happened last week, never mind 15 years ago. Um, but our speaker today really had this impact on everyone. And he's an interesting individual who had journalism skills and went to work on Wall Street and succeeded there and, and decided to make a career move and transition into a family business in home health care and nursing where he has just moved up the ladder successfully and quickly and he's delighted to come here today to talk to you about his experiences, his life, his experiences at URI and also about communication in general and communication specifically in a healthcare industry. And so I'm very happy to welcome Jonathan Herman. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, I appreciate it. Thank you, uh, everyone. It is a, it's an honor, it's a privilege to be back speaking to, to so many students. And if you can't hear me in the back, just yell and I'll, I'll raise my voice. Uh, Adam and I were talking last week, and we were just going over what we're going to accomplish today, what we're going to talk about, who I'm going to meet, what we're going to do. And I was, I was really excited. I told him that I can't wait. I haven't been back to campus for a couple years, but I, I am in touch with professors and, and other students, a lot of my friends. And I said, most importantly, though, do you, and there is one of uh, my favorite professors now, Linda Levin. Uh, I said, do you, are you familiar with, with my story? And what happened to me when I was younger and, and how it shaped me and, and who I am today. And he said, no, not, not really. I said, look at, look at our family, look at my, my company's websites, Preferred Home Healthcare, look at, look at the website, read our story, and I think you'll find it informative. But in the meantime, I'm going to summarize 38 years of my life in basically two or three sentences. And I did just that. I told him what happened to me. And I said, please share it with the students. And I think he did. And for those of you who are familiar with the story, and for those of you not, I, 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 want, to, I want to give you a background of how I got to where I am today and what happened to me and how it transformed the way that I think. When I was four years old, my father passed away from lymphoma, which is a, a blood-based cancer. Uh, that left my mom to care for me and my older brother, who He's, uh, he's four years older than me. Uh, about seven years later, when I was 11 years old, my mother was diagnosed with malignant melanoma, which is a form of skin cancer that if it's found early, it is treatable. But unfortunately, this, at this stage, it wasn't. It was found late, it wasn't curable, and she was given about a year to live. So at that time, uh, my family, our family, decided that it would be best if the three of us moved in with my aunt and uncle because my mom wasn't capable of caring for herself, let alone her two sons, and my aunt would be her primary caregiver. When we moved in, my aunt was also pregnant, and soon after, a couple months later, uh, she gave birth to a child that was born severely ill. They didn't, the doctors didn't know what was wrong with him, they just knew that he wasn't going to have a normal life, if, if at all. So, under one roof, 
what's happening to one family was that my mother was my mother was sick she was on the verge of passing away and my aunt and uncle also had a child that was just severely ill and just wasn't going to make it either so within a handful of months of each other my mother passed away and my aunt and uncle's son passed away and as you could imagine uh, being 12 years old it's such an impressionable impressionable moment in your life uh, I realized that my life, it certainly wasn't going to be a straight line up. And I knew that there was going to be a void, a, a psychological, emotional, and physical void of the loss of my parents. But based on my internal strength and my fortitude and surrounded by loving family and friends, uh, I made a point to live a, a normal life. I tried to live a normal life, and I, I think we did, we accomplished that. I was interested in the same things that you all were interested in growing up. Uh, I was into my social life. I was into athletics. I traveled around to see the Grateful Dead play all over the East Coast. I was into, I was into ladies. They weren't really into me, uh, but I, it was an interest of mine. And. And that's still, I mean, I, somehow I duped my wife into marrying me. But uh, the, and grades for me, though, grades were always secondary. As they say, I did enough just to get by. I got Bs, maybe B minuses, but it wasn't a priority for me. The, the, my academic career, it wasn't, it wasn't, as I said, it was a backseat. It wasn't, it wasn't a priority. And that was fine. And it was great until senior year in high school when I met with a college advisor. And he said, OK. Tell me, tell me all about yourself. So I told him my story, what I just told you. Uh, I told him all the activities I was involved in. I played baseball. I, was, uh, I wrote for the school newspaper. I was in, involved with other activities and clubs. And I said, this is my story, and here are my grades. And he said, perfect. Where do you want to apply to? And I said, Ohio State, Maryland, Indiana, University of Rhode Island, Delaware. And he said, you could apply to those schools, but you're not going to get in with these grades. They want more. We need to apply to some safe schools as well. And we did. And one of the safe schools was actually Roger Williams here in Rhode Island. And we compiled the applications. I'm sure it was much different then than it is now. And 10, 11, 12 applications, they all go out in the mail. And true to form, letters start coming back. And it was rejection, rejection, accepted, accepted, rejection, accepted, rejection, accepted. Every letter comes back from the schools that we apply to except one. And that was the University of, uh, University of Rhode Island. It was this, this school, this institution that I love so much. And I was thinking, oh my god, did they, did they not get my application? Did they not receive it? They probably did. They're just waiting. And at that point, I knew I was in some kind of gray area. I wasn't accepted, but I wasn't yet rejected. So there was hope. There was hope that I could get into the University of Rhode Island. A couple days go by, another week or two weeks go by, and finally the letter comes from the admissions office. And I scrambled to open it up. And it was not like any other letter that I received. It was a handwritten letter, and unfortunately I lost it amongst a couple moves later in life. But it said something to the effect of, Jonathan, we appreciate that you had a lot else to worry about or other things to worry about than just your grades growing up. So if you could show us that you did well in your first semester in high school, we will happily accept you into this university. And you could bet your bottom dollar for someone who never really worked hard in school. I went home every day and I worked my tail off to make sure I got A's and B's in that first semester. And I did. I got my transcript and I mailed it off to this college and they wrote me back and they said, we will happily take you as a student to the University of Rhode Island. And that made, that made my moment senior year in high school. That was in the fall of 1994. I came up here for the first time in April of 1995, and I was hooked, just as I'm sure all of you were when you saw the campus for the first time in the beautiful spring. And not that I really had any other options except University of Rhode Island. But I knew at that moment, when they accepted me into this college, they were taking a risk. They were taking a gamble. They saw something in me that I don't necessarily know if I saw in myself. But they were allowing me to come to this school, to come to this unbelievable institution. When other people, thousands of other kids, wanted to, to be in that position, to be in my spot, and they were probably rejected. And I knew at that moment, when I got to this college, I was going to make a difference. 
And sure enough, when I came up here in the fall of 1995, I was in Bur uh, Burnside Hall, freshman year, I hold myself up in that dorm room and I did nothing but work. I did nothing but study. I did nothing but focus on my academic career. Because I knew, again, this school, they took a chance, they took a gamble on me when they didn't have to. And I was going to prove to this school, and most importantly myself, that I'm going to make a career, I'm going to make a, a professional and personal career out of my life. That was freshman year. And then as I progressed and I picked my major in journalism, sophomore year and junior year and senior year, I started to develop deep and passionate relationships with a lot of professors in this, in this university here. And there are two of them right here. There's Linda Levin back there. Linda, yes. And there's Rabbi Jagalinzer. And at that moment, I realized that the teachers, the teachers here that you all interact with every day, they are here to help unlock your potential, uncork your potential, just like they did for me. And they promised that they would always be there for me. And that is true for Linda Levin. She adopted me as her Rhode Island son. She, will, she said she will always be my Rhode Island mom. And true to form, she's here. She's sitting here today. And Rabbi Jagalinzer, we developed such a deep relationship and we stayed in touch that he was the officiating rabbi at the wedding uh, with my wife and I in 2009, about six years ago. And I want to make sure that all of you recognize that your teachers here, they are here to help unlock your potential, allow you to flourish. They are going to make sure that you bloom wherever you are planted. I promise you. Take that risk with them. That's what they are here for. They see something in you that you may not see in yourself. I promise you. And everything I learned, especially in Linda's class, because she was so tough and she was so challenging, it prepared me for so much else, even though I ne didn't necessarily go into journalism as my major. Or I didn't necessarily go into journalism, even though it was my major. I read recently that the average person lives about 30,000 days. 30,000. I am somewhere in the 14,000, 14,500 range. I think all of you here, maybe 7, 7,500. 30,000 days. Some of you are going to live more and some of you are going to live less. But every day that you live, you take off one of those pages, one of those 30,000 pages of your book, that book of your life. And once you turn that page, you can never get that page back. You can never get that day back, that hour back, that minute back, that second back. And that's why I hope I could at least give you some guidance, some motivation, some inspiration to go do something special in your life. I am living proof. I understand how valuable each day is. My father passed away when he was 38 years old in 62 days. I am 38 now. I have about 30 days to outlive my father, and I think about that almost every day. That's how precious life is. It's important, though, that you surround yourself with the right people, with the right friends, with the right faculty who will help unleash that talent, unleash that potential, and allow you to maximize, maximize those 30,000 days. Because when I was sitting in these classes, and I was 21 or 22 years old, I thought that 38 was so far off. And my mom passed away and she was 42. And gosh, I'm 21, I'm 22. It's, that's so far. I tell you, it's not far. It's not far at all. I graduated this college almost 16 years ago and it went like that. It's great to be content. And I'm content with so much in my life. And again, a lot of the great people that I surround myself, they help me. They help me get to where I am. I am proud of what we're doing as a company at Preferred Home Healthcare, and it's what we are doing. It's not what I am doing. I am surrounded by some great friends. One here, Todd Thede. He's our CFO. He's brilliant. He's smart. He's articulate. He's loquacious. He's never shy from our conversation, so please, I encourage you to introduce yourself to him. And most importantly, he's known me since I'm 13 years old. The only, the only drawback is that, and he will be proud to tell you, he went to Rutgers, not Rhode Island. <laughs> but surround yourself with great people and they will bring out the best in you being content with everything again is 
it's good. It, 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 it's important. But if you're content with everything that you have, that future that you dream of, it may never come. It may not come. So always think big, dream big. I always thought about coming back to this school. Always thought about coming back and talking to students once I left because I know this school, it allowed me, it took a chance on me, it took a gamble on me, and I wanted to repay it back. I gave a small donation in honor of Linda, and I'm gonna keep doing that. This small talk with all of you, it's just, I hope, a fraction of what I could give back to this university in the decades ahead. I hope that we could build the company that I am building, that we are building, which is right now in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. We also bought a company in Andover, Massachusetts, not too far from here, that focuses on uh, durable medical equipment. We're also branching out into maternal health and wellness, which focuses on pre and postnatal women. But we are building, we have grand visions, and I hope I could build this company, we could build this company so big one day that the university will come back and say to me, you did a heck of a job in your life, in your career, and you gave so much back to the school. Will you come and talk to the graduating class? That is my big dream, and it's okay to dream big. It's great to dream big. And it's okay to come up short, and it's okay to fail, I promise you. And if you're not failing, then you are not doing something new. You're not dreaming big enough. I have failed so many times in my life, so many times. But through those failures and through coming up short, you learn a lot. If you analyze why you came up short and why you failed, you learn. You learn from that. And it helps you, it helps you and it creates your success moving forward. If that and what I just spoke about for the last 15, 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever it was, wasn't motivating or it was unexciting or not important or didn't move you or inspire you in any way, let me remind you of one other, or let me tell you one other part of my family history of why it's just a miracle that I am standing here today. My grandmother, who is now 87, is a Holocaust survivor. She was taking, uh, taken by the Nazis when she was 16 years old, and she survived multiple concentration camps for over a year. This April will be 70 years to the month that she was liberated from Bergen-Belsen, which is a concentration camp. She was then taken to Sweden, where she was, she was helped, she was allowed to recover, and she came to this country with literally nothing, except a dream to grow a family that I am so lucky to be a part of. So the odds of me standing right here and talking to all of you are so extreme, astronomical, it almost shouldn't even be possible. But I am here, I am here, and I wanna give back. I wanna give back in so many different ways. And I'm so proud to be here, I'm so proud and excited that you actually took the time to respond, now on Facebook I see, to RSVP, to come here to see me speak when you certainly didn't have to. And I know the minutes, the 45 minutes or so that we're gonna to spend together I know you won't ever get them back, and that's why I want to make them valuable for you. I want to invest your time wisely. That was a big mission, a big goal of mine. I, re I rehearsed this speech multiple times to my wife, who would sit there and watch me pace in our living room with a with remote controller in my hand, going over everything I'm about to say or everything I did say. I just want to say thank you again. It's such an honor to be here. It's such an honor to talk to you. It's such a privilege, and I hope, I just hope that I could utilize your time wisely. Again, I, I want to thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to my story. Of course, I want to answer as many questions as possible. And again, just thank you. Thank you for allowing me to do this and to fulfill a small, short-term goal in my life. Thank you. That's it. I, I hope, yeah, go ahead. It's, yes, like I said, it's my first time ever doing this. I hope it's not my last. I want it to be free flowing. I don't want to uh, ramble on. I would prefer that uh, I take a lot of questions or answer as many questions as possible. I'm yes. Sure the students have a lot. Yeah. There's one down here. It seems odd, doesn't it? Standing up in front. Yes. It's, me when I raise yes, it's a role reversal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
he really thought he did want to do journalism. So I sent him or he went over to the cigar office. And this is when the cigar was a daily. And um, he was trying to figure out, he didn't want to be a reporter. He didn't really want to be an editor. What was he going to do? John was passionate about stocks, stocks and Wall Street. So I said to him, why don't you write a Wall Street column? And John wrote the one and only, and probably forever, only column on Wall Street and stocks that appeared regularly in the Good Five Cent Cigar for, what, at least a year. So I like to think that was one of your contributions, too. Yeah. And again, it's just being with the right people. You inspired me. You gave me the idea, the vision to write that. I don't think it's been resurrected since, but that was my contribution. And thank you. Yeah. Uh, great question. I, the years on Wall Street for me were really valuable because I got to a better understanding of how businesses worked. I got to meet a lot of management, a lot of CEOs working on Wall Street. So I got a, a very deep understanding of what it would take to get a company to where I wanted it to be. Ultimately, I, I saw myself running a company. I always felt that my leadership skills, my ability to get people to think and move in one direction would be beneficial. But I didn't fully understand and grasp what it took to run a company until I worked on Wall Street, went to conferences, met with CEOs, and just seeing how they talk, how they interact, what they do, their, their obsession with their professional career. You need to be obsessed. You need to be happy. As Steve Jobs said, you have to, you have to want to put a, a ding in this world. And I saw that with some great CEOs. And I don't think, if I didn't have my time on Wall Street, I don't think I would have seen that firsthand, I would have witnessed that. But there were so many CEOs that I met that influenced me, influenced the way that, that, I, that I think, how I run the company. And without that time, without that experience, I just wouldn't be where I am today. So, yes? Um, being that you're a journalism major, you yeah. probably require to take a lot of writing courses. How important do you think it is for people who are, like, who are not journalism majors to take a writing course before like, they're graduating? Yeah, it's a great question. Writing is a critical skill. Uh, even, even now, I know everyone's texting and it's shorthand, but still, it, it's, writing is a critical skill. It's important. Even in emails, you could see, I always, I always could gauge the, I don't want to say the intellect of someone, but someone who cares, who's passionate about how it represents them. When you put something out there and it has your name, it represents you. Be sure that it represents you the way that you want to be represented. And when you're writing a sentence or paragraphs or a novel or whatever it may be, it represents you and your thinking. So I do think it's critical. And anything you do, you're going to be writing, you're going to be communicating, you're going to be speaking. And it's going to be a representation of you. So how do you want to be represent how do you want yourself represented in front of other people? So I think it's critical. I think it's important. Yeah. Yes. Um, on your website, um, I noticed that there's like a contact us tab that you yes. like, can't really get away from. So I thought that like encourage communication from customers. And I was just wondering um, in what ways and like what time frame do you respond to customer like complaints or concerns? Huh. Uh, let's say that's a great question. Uh, they all come to me, right? The complaints, and the complaints represent our care in the communities. And for us, stronger stronger communities will lead to a stronger business. And I know that it's my family's company, so I have to respond. I try and respond immediately to, to problems, to questions. Um, it's having that special connection with people uh, is part of growing a business. And sometimes people just like to complain. They're not happy unless they're complaining. And I want to hear their complaints. I want to hear their story. I want to hear why they're not happy with our service for whatever reason. And through that, you could always learn. You could always learn from what people are telling you, and you can make your business better. So we try and address these problems as quickly as we can. I give my cell phone number out. I give my business card out. I give my email address out. I don't mind. I, I encourage that communication. And I think resolving problems head on and quickly, because problems don't get better with age. In fact, they get worse, is critical, especially in our business where it's very competitive like any business, and there are multiple agencies that could care for this client. So I know it's important. And when they hear that the nephew of the owner is calling to make sure that their problem is resolved, they believe in that. 
And again, it's my word. I'm putting my word and my, my face and my voice and my writing and my communication out there. And I, I, I keep that to a high standard. So you try and resolve problems as quickly as you can. Because like I said, they don't get better. In fact, they get worse. Yes? Can you spoke briefly about an acquisition with um, a medical equipment company sure. in mass. Uh, what would you say is the importance of like, the communication between you and other companies when you're trying to network and expand? Great question. We, Todd was really the mastermind behind uh, our acquisition. Uh, but this, this came on the market. It's a, a durable medical equipment or DME company. And they specialize in pediatric nebulizers. And for those of you who don't know what nebulizers, is, it's a little machine and there's a mask and it helps uh, children with respiratory issues. Um, so that was, their, that was their one product. And it was a small operation. And then just by hard work but a lot of luck, the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare as, as it's known, uh, included the coverage, uh, it made mandatory that insurance companies cover breast pumps. So now breast pumps are covered by insurance. And we expanded our product line to include breast pumps. Uh, but when we acquired the company, it was just strictly nebulizers, and it was a small business. And part of what we had to do, and part of what I do, Todd is the numbers guy, but I'm the culture guy. And when I went up there, I had to make sure that the culture of that company <coughs> was similar to how we're running preferred home health care. And a lot of that was communicating. It was being there. It was face to face, just like this. And letting them know that there was going to be change, but it was going to be a positive change. And I'm going to be here to ensure that, this, that what we're doing, integrating these two companies, was going to be favorable, favorable for you. So it was. it was. It was communicating. It was honest communication. It was transparent communication. And it's your word. Always go back to that. It's your word. It was my word that I'm putting back there. And I'm proud to say now, two and a half years after this acquisition, we have built up the business uh, to include, I think there are about 19 people now. Is that right? Including billing 25. They're including billing. There are now 25 people. When we took over this operation, there were four sales guys, maybe two or three in internal people. So there were seven people. And one moved to Florida, but the rest are still here. And they can't believe what a company did to work for. But it was our communication. It was our open dialogue. Again, it was always me being available for these people, knowing that they could, they could always call me or they could call Todd or anyone at the company. And we would make sure that, uh, that we're there for them, that the change is good, that this company is going to be much better than it was as you previously knew it. So it was important. And as we look to make future acquisitions, we're getting better and we understand what to do. Uh, we made a couple mistakes, but you learn from those mistakes. So, yeah. Yes? Well, first I want to commend you on using things you went through to give you strength to go forward. Um, what did Panalone and Linda Levin teach? Like, what was the most important skill that they taught you to keep going? Sure. <laughs> With Linda, it was easy. Uh, <laughs> really easy. I don't, did anyone here have the privilege of being a student? No. Okay. A quirk with Linda is that she wouldn't give out A's. And it drove me crazy. It drove me crazy. I didn't understand at the time because I, on one of my, one, one semester, I think I got straight A's and an A minus from her, of course. And it just, it just bothered me, it irked me at the time. And she was happy about that. And I only realized later in life that she was doing it for a good reason because she was pushing me and she was pushing everyone to work harder. And I won't ever forget that. Getting an A is really tough. It's really hard. It's almost being perfect. And being perfect is really challenging. And that's what she did. She pushed, she pushed us to work harder. So I always think about that. I never got an A in her class. I got an A on some papers, but never got an A overall. Only an A minus when I was good. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, for Professor Pantaloni, and I just saw him uh, an, an hour ago, uh, who I, I think a lot of you know or are familiar with, I just thanked him. I thanked him for everything that he did to me. And as I was telling my wife and Todd, what I loved about Professor Pantaloni was the responsibility he thrust on me. He allowed me to be a TA my senior year. He didn't have to do that. But again, he saw something in me that I didn't necessarily see in myself at the time. And here, here John, take, 
take over a handful of students, work with them, you're going to do their grades, you're going to mark their grades, you're going to give them guidance, and you're going to be a role model for them. I trust you to do it. And he trusted me. And it just left a real indelible impression on my mind, on my thinking, like, hey, maybe there is something here that I don't yet see that everyone else does. So it was a responsibility that he gave me at a very young age that, that was very impressionable. It was really important. Thank you. Yes? Um, being in the healthcare field, effective communication is crucial. What method of communication do you use to immediately contact your staff and why? <laughs> a good question. <laughs> we, in our Outlook, email Outlook, there is, a, there is an all. And it goes, you know, if I need to immediately communicate with everyone at the company, there's an all feature. I could send an email and it goes out to everybody. Uh, I don't necessarily enjoy doing that because it's impersonal. I think the way that we've been able to grow, and this is something that I'm really proud of. When we started, when I, I joined Preferred, and I'm approaching my 10-year anniversary, there were four offices. We've grown to, at the end of this year, we'll have 12 offices uh, in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And the way, that we, the way that we've been able to grow is by communicating directly with our employees, embracing our employees. I love to go to every office and communicate with them at that moment, in the moment, just like this, because they see it, they feel it, they hear it. Email is just very impersonal. If it has to be done via email, then I will do via email. Otherwise, I prefer to wait and really interact with them. I'm also proud to say that we have such a high retention rate. When someone gets into preferred, and it's not easy, it's hard. We make the interview process very hard. But when they get in, because it's hard to get a job, it's hard to leave. And they feel that it's a family-owned company. And a family-owned company in this environment, it's tough. But they feel that love. They feel the energy. And they feel that we care. Our website is preferredcares.com because we do care. And the way that I show my employees and the way that I communicate with them most effectively is face-to-face. -face. And that's what I love doing. Yes? Um, you just said that you make it really hard for the application yes. process. So what do you look for when you're going through this? Ah, good question. Personality. I, I, I do think about giving them a writing test, but uh, we, we haven't incorporated that just yet. Uh, personality. We're not doing rocket engineering. We're not, it's not a very challenging business, but you need personality because it's a sale. And you, have, you work with a lot of nurses and a lot of aides, and you work with a lot of families who have a lot of issues going on. So you need that personality, and you need the toughness. So we look for personality in people, and then we can mold them to what we think they should be and how they should act in our office. But without personality, it's going to be tough. It's going to be challenging. So that's what we look for first and foremost. Yeah. Yes? Um, some people say that mentioning personal aspects of your life show engagement in um, the, the position that you're looking into. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering, uh, when interviewing someone or when getting interviewed yourself yes. in the past, uh, what, where's the line between too much personal information or too much personal connection? Sure. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, when we interview someone, I do ask them, what is, do you know the story behind Preferred? Why did it get started? And if they don't know the answer, in my mind, they're already, they're already out. I don't consider them a candidate. If someone who's coming in and they want a job at our company, they need to know the story. If they don't know the story, if they didn't do a modicum of research, then I don't necessarily want them at this company because I think it's indicative of how they're going to work. So I think they need to know the story, first and foremost. Uh, and then what they share on their own, because I want to get out of that. I want a true sense of who they are, of what they are, what makes them tick. And I think the smart people could delineate, OK, this is, this is appropriate. This is what I want to share. And this, what I had for dinner last night or what I did this weekend, this isn't appropriate. You could sense who's right and who's wrong. So I've interviewed literally hundreds of people at the company. And you get a sense right off the bat. I, I understand who will work and who won't work at the company. So, yes. I just wanted to get into your uh, your personal like career path a sure. little bit. So, you went from journalism here yes. to Wall Street yes. to working for <coughs> home, or at sure. your family yeah. company. So, in every step, how important were your soft skills compared to your hard uh, business skills? I guess. Uh, believe it or not, I am soft. I am soft. I'm um, hard during interviews, uh, but I am softer. Once you get in, I'm, I'm soft. I'm lovable. I'm sensitive. 
and uh, but there is. I think you you don't want to rule with an iron fist. Maybe an iron fist with a velvet glove. Uh, your your employees, as I like to think, it's. My job isn't necessarily always to be nice to people, it's to make them better. And, but there is a line. And while I want to be tough on them, I also have to be soft and sensitive and recognize that they have feelings just like we have feelings. So it's good, it's a balance. So how did you go from journalism to working on Wall Street? Now she said that you had a column, is that, did you just land upon an opportunity? Yeah, so I always want, I wanted to combine journalism, which is, a passion of mine, uh, as well as Wall Street and stocks and finance. So I always wanted to be a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. When I graduated in 1999, uh, the world of journalism was changing, and I didn't think that was going to be the right career path. So I transitioned to working on Wall Street at Smith Barney, which is now part of Morgan Stanley. Um, and after working on Wall Street for about five years, I realized that I wasn't fulfilled. It was it was money, 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 and it was rapacious, and it was greed, and I just wasn't getting personal or professional fulfillment. I wanted to give back to society. Uh, I admire Albert, Albert Einstein, and something that he said was, every person's responsibility in this world, he believed, was to put more into the world than you take out of it. And I felt at that time, 10 years ago, 11, 12 years ago, that I was just sucking more out of this world. I wasn't contributing. And now I feel like I am contributing. I am giving back to families, to communities. I understand what people are going through. I lost both my parents by the time I was 12 years old. And when I share that story with people, they are touched, they understand. I'm empathetic to what they're going through. And I really feel that I am giving back to them. I am giving something to them. And giving something to them may just be listening, hearing their story because they want to share it and I want to be here. And that was, the, that was the career transition in my mind. Giving back more to society. How can I do that? And it led me to here, it led me to right now. And I'm thankful and I'm blessed for that, really. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes? How has your journalism degree helped you um, in your day-to-day -day communication preferred now? Um, I destroy everyone in emails when they make mistakes. <laughs> really. um, the, <laughs> Uh, I, uh, they know I have a high standard, and I'm very picky, and I'll nitpick. And people will send me emails to proof before they send them out. Uh, I'll also write our press releases, I'll copy edit our designs, our editing, our marketing. Nothing gets by me, and it's a control factor, but nothing gets by me unless I see it. Once I see it, I have other people that I work with just to make sure I'm not missing something. But I see it every day. And in emails, people will be sloppy, and it will just drive me insane. And they'll know it. But you have to set the bar high. And when you, when you set a bar high, people know that they have to at least match that, if not hop over it. So people understand. When they send me something, it better be good. It better be right. Yes. Rabbi. John. Yes. I'm honored and delighted to be here today. And I take great pride in seeing you standing up here and sharing with us, and I thank you for that very much. Well, thank you. When I taught at URI for over 30 years, I was younger then. <laughs> <laughs> um, every once in a while, a student came down the pike who you could see was special. Jonathan was one of those students. He wasn't in the class to just learn or to attain a grade. He was there to experience the total class. And so uh, I taught Hebrew, so Jonathan had to learn an entirely new language. Um, I was tough on him, just like he's tough on the emails. When he would write in Hebrew, I would correct. And he would come up after class, and we would go over what I had corrected. So it wasn't that he just provided the assignment and left, but rather he stayed and he learned. And so Jonathan was the kind of student that a professor relishes, one who not only is influenced by the professor, but also influences the professor. And he was that very special student, and obviously the association relationship 
has um, sustained itself and nurtured and grown over these years. And John, I just wanted to say again, I'm very proud of you. Thank you. Well, thank you for the kind words. It means a lot to me. Yes? Um, what failures have you dealt with within your company and how did you overcome them? Sure. Great, uh, great question. Uh, about seven, eight years ago, we tried to franchise our business and it failed. It didn't work. And uh, we had five, six, seven franchises and they didn't work. It failed. And it was a great, it was a great, great business lesson. It was a real life business experience for me that I was able to capitalize on. And we did. We analyzed the reasons why we failed, why it didn't work. And there were a variety of reasons. But it was a huge, huge failure. But in that failure, there was so much success. And I think because we failed so well, the company is running much better now. And that was a huge, huge, huge business, business experience, business lesson that generally I would only be able to read about. But I was actually lucky enough and fortunate enough to live it. And it was a huge, it was a huge influence on my life. And I think about it all the time, the mistakes that we made and not to repeat them moving forward. So that's how you overcame the drawbacks of it? Yes. But you couldn't recognize it at the time. I couldn't recognize that, oh my God, we're, we're gonna, this is not going to work, and that's it. It was, it was going through it. It was trying to make it work, and then realizing that, hey, we gave it our best, and it's not going to work. And here are the reasons why. This is what we learned from failing from franchising. And I think it was, it was instrumental in helping us build the company to where it is now. Really important. It's a great question. Thank you. Yes? Another good question. We use Yellow Book, Billboards, Facebook, Twitter, Google AdWords, Bing, and anything else? Radio. And radio. Yeah, my uncle, who uh, one of the most generous, kind people you will ever meet, has taken a liking to radio. And <laughs> to the chagrin of Todd, because it's really expensive. <laughs> but uh, he, he's on the radio three days a week and heavily advertises preferred, and he loves it. And I don't see him giving that up anytime soon. So we try and use a diversity of advertising and marketing measures. Some of them work and some of them don't. Uh, but ultimately, every person is a salesperson for this company. Every person that we hire, whether it's an internal employee or an external field staff, they are marketing for preferred. They work for preferred. They carry our brand, our name, and of course our philosophy in the, in the community. So everybody's a marketer. Good question. Yes? How central, how crucial is it to be involved in organizations during your undergrad years? For me, I, I was involved with the good five cents cigar. And uh, from that, I was able to develop, refine, and hone my skills. And I do think it was important to, I wish I would have gotten involved in more. I was involved in some athletics, in flag football, um, the good five cents cigar. But reflecting back on my time, I wish I would have been involved in more and would have been exposed to other broader topics. Uh, but. The time at the Good Five, Cent, Good Five Cent Cigar was important. I developed some good relationships, refined my skills. Um, but like I said, I wish I would have explored more, definitely. So it's important. And, and expand your lens, expand your horizon. I think it's, it's critical. And you'll, you'll grow and you'll learn as a person. Do you have any like, specific organizations or types of organizations you think are more essential to the university or to the students? Uh, I wish I was more familiar with what's going on right now. Uh, Adam and I were talking about Hillel recently, or just uh, an hour or so ago. I wasn't too involved with Hillel. Uh, that's a Jewish organization on campus. I wish I was. Um, but I would, again, look to uh, explore and, and broaden, broaden your lens. I think it's important. Yes? Um, it kind of goes back to the question before the last one. Would you say that social media has helped you expand your company for the better in terms of referrals and testimonials? And who do you think your main audience is on like Facebook or Twitter? Sure, great question. I do, yes, everyone is on Facebook, Twitter, social media. I think there's, uh, there's a lot of upside in being on those mediums. The downside, of course, is you're living in a fishbowl. So people could write negative comments, and they, and they don't hold back, and they write them quickly. So you have, to, you have to really be on your game. I think social media has forced us to be better. They may, social media has made us a better company. Um, 
And yes, we are hitting, we think, the right demographics. A big part of our company is pediatrics, and the younger generation is on Facebook, they're on Twitter, uh, they're on Instagram, so we do want to connect with those, with those potential clients because they are there, and that's where, uh, that's where we get a lot of referrals. So uh, yeah, we need to be there. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Past in my professional life or my personal life? Personal. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> as I said, uh, death for me, it's all, it, it, when I was younger, it was always around me. And uh, that little bubble, that, that soft, compassionate bubble that most children have, even, even up to their college years, for me it was pop very early. Um, I... Uh, the loss of my mother was a, a really deep moment in my life. I'm, at 12 years old, it left, uh, it left a really, uh, really deep impression on me. So as I got older and I was able to comprehend and understand really what happened to me, I wake up every morning living the life of three people, me, my, my father, and my mother, uh, because they just never got to live. As I said, when you're 21 or 22 or 20, however old, however old you are, you think that 38 and 42, it's so far off, but it's just not. And uh, I recognize now that my parents never had a chance to live. So their death has forced me to live much beyond my boundaries, has pushed me to work harder and grow and try and take risks, take, take gambles, capitalize on opportunities because they may not be here. And that's why I try, I try not squander anything. And I try and maximize my time. And again, me coming back here, so important. It's so important for me, this chapter that I am writing in my book. I, I know that my parents may never have had an opportunity to do that. But I, I am here, and I am trying to do that. So that's how it's an influenced and affected me. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes? Um, going off that same question, um, back to your personal life, I sure. can actually relate. Um, I also lost my father at a very young age, mm -hmm. and instead of using it as a crutch, I've always found myself using it to push myself to be a better person and everything like that. So um, instead of um, on more of a professional level, like within um, business, do you find yourself seeing that you've pushed yourself to become more successful through your past, or is it just... No, I, that, that's, a, that's a great question. I'm sorry for your loss as well. Um, Yes, it's a motivating factor. It has pushed me beyond uh, what I would probably think otherwise. I also recognize that my parents probably made the ultimate sacrifice to get me to where I am. Because if my parents were still here, we don't go into home care, I don't go to URI, and I'm not standing here. So I think about all that. And I do use it as motivation, and it pushes me every single day. I think about it every day. And yes, it pushes me to work harder, both personally and professionally. So, yes. Um, I love this suit, by the way. Thank you very much. Uh, one day, you know, when it's all out of time, it's all, um, yeah. in the far future, people and everybody, um, how do you want to be remembered? What do I want my legacy to be? Yeah, how do you want people to look back at your life and your contribution to society? It's uh, a great question. I, I hope that our company survives. I read a stat recently, and I'm always reading, by the way, that the average company lasts for about 25 years. We are now approaching somewhere around 27, 28 years. And I hope my legacy will be that my company, that our company survives. And they treat the company, they treat the employees the way that I do. And that the company continues to grow and evolve and expand. Because one day I won't be here. But my legacy hopefully will be this company. And of course, just I want to be remembered for my, gener my generosity, uh, giving back, so critical, and supporting communities, towns, states, uh, whatever, whatever I could do to give back, to make someone's life better, that's how I want to be remembered. Yeah, good question. Yes? I knew nothing about home health care. Totally brand new business. Even though my family experienced the need for it in 1989, 1990, home care was much different then than it is now. 
Um, so I literally knew nothing about home health care. And it was a totally different business line. So going from Wall Street and analyzing companies to actually helping run a company, and I really started at the bottom, um, I didn't know. I didn't know anything. It was transitioning to a totally new career. So I had to learn. I had to relearn skills and relearn knowledge. Um, and it took time. But that experience allowed me to grow and to blossom into what I am today. So, good question. Yes? Oh. Yeah. You own the family company. Yeah. You like to say that you care and you stress that. When you have these uh, interview processes that you say you make them really difficult, sure. how important is it to see people coming out of college with things who are more than just a brain? Because you see, you see so many kids with, for our generation that you have to go to college because you need that to get a good job. But it's kind of just a body. There's no personality. There's no someone who really buys into it. As you said, if they don't know your background, you look right past them. Mm -hmm. So you see these kids that on their rap sheet, you know, they have the grades, they have everything they sure. need, but you sit down and you talk to them. And even a communication major, they still can't communicate. It's not there. They don't right. know how to be personal. They don't know how to do things like that. So would you, as a business, and would you look for someone who has you know, on paper, perfect, or you really see it when you talk to them, that you can feel they care, and there's more than just a brain. Sure. I, uh, it's a great question, and I don't necessarily look at, at resumes. Uh, some of the most successful people in our company never went to college, and I'm very cognizant of that. Uh, so I don't necessarily look at their resumes. I want to feel them. I want to engage them. I want to see what they're about. I want to learn about them. Like I always say, they have a story, and I want to hear it. And I always ask random questions because I want to get a sense of who they are, of how they're going to interact. Because ultimately, the person that I hire is going to represent our company. That's a big order. That's a big task. So I just want to try and make sure it's the right one. Now, I don't have the final say. We have multiple rounds of interviews. The person meets with multiple people. And then we come together and we say, OK, here are the pros. This is why we think this person could work for us. And here are the cons. But we think we could take the cons and make them into pros. And that's how it goes. So it's not necessarily just me having the final say. I want other people to look and interview and get a sense of this person. Because ultimately, I won't have that much interaction with that new hire. It's someone else, the manager of the office or the manager of marketing, whoever it may be. So we come together and it's a collaborative decision to make sure that we're on the same point, that we, we see the same things and the same differences in that person. Does that help? Good. Yes? Uh, clearly, you have a passion and motivation for what you do. You talk about how it motivates you every day. Yeah. Um, how would you get your employees to share that same passion and motivation that you have? They, the way that you sense it, from me, they sense it as well. But think about this in a more intimate office. Uh, and they see me just so passionate, so eager, so willing to do whatever it is that they need. They feed off of that. And that's where the culture stems from. They see my passion. They understand what I went through when I was younger. And they see how I built myself up from nothing. When I, was, when I was 12 and I lost my mom, I felt like I had nobody in the world. I felt isolated and alone. And growing up through, through middle school and high school, I could have turned to drugs and drinking, but I didn't. I turned to, to business. I turned to finance, to music that kept me grounded. And people at the company, they recognize that. They see that I had a choice. I could have went A or B. And they feed off of that passion, off of that energy. And that's why they never leave. We have almost a 0% turnover rate. We lose maybe one or two people a year, if that. But they feel the energy. They feel the passion. And they want to be a part of it. And it motivates them to do better. If I can motivate my employees, our employees, to do better when I'm not there, then we're doing something right. And I take a lot of pride in that. So it's a good question. Yes? No. Sure. Uh, my uncle said, here, of course, you could come work for the company, but you're starting here. And it was literally, it was in corporate, and it was, I don't want to say the bottom, but it was just learning the business. And then after a couple months, I was given the opportunity to run an office. Uh, and I ran an office down in southern New Jersey for about 18 months. And that was probably the most valuable experience that, that I had at the company. And I would encourage everyone to really understand every facet of the business. Because I couldn't just leap into where I am now. I may not have been the right person for it. But I was able to grow and mature into that position, into this position. So 
Learn every task, understand every facet of the business, and you'll be a much better operator. You'll be much smarter, and people will respect you as well. Thank you. Yes? Do you have any advice for people that haven't, or students that haven't quite found their passion yet, or what they want to do when they grow up? <laughs> uh, it's a great question, and I refer to Steve Jobs quite a bit because he inspired me in so many different ways. And he said, as with so many matters of the heart, you'll know it when you find it. And it will click for you at some point. And you'll know in your heart when you find it. And that's, that's my advice. I don't want to say you're going to find it here. You'll find it after college, 10 years after college. You'll find it. It will come to you, I promise. Okay. Yes? Um, you're a very inspiring guy and very motivational guy. Thank you. And um, just like how you feel about your past professors, do you yes. have people that work for you like give you <coughs> feedback and have that same feeling towards you? Um, so I'm, I feel like I'm blushing. Uh, <laughs> yes, they do. Um, and I save a lot of the emails. People in the company will write me handwritten cards, and I love handwritten cards because it's so easy to send an email these days. But when you get a handwritten card from someone, there was thought that went into that. And some of the kindest, most thoughtful people at the company will give me cards and I save them. My wife knows my, my, my dresser at home is filled with these cards and I'll read them. And what they say about me, it pushes me to work harder. It pushes me to be a better person, a better man. And it's inspiring. And that's what led me to today. And if, again, if I could lead and I can inspire our employees, uh, we're going to do something good. Uh, it's a little challenging because I am their boss and you have to delineate whether they're telling you the truth or whether they're just brown-nosing you or whatever it may be. Uh, but for the most part, uh, they don't have to be at the company. They don't have to stay. Uh, they could leave if they want to, but they don't. Uh, we pay our people very well. Uh, we're growing. We're expanding. And uh, they see a passionate leader, and they respond to that. So I do. And it's kind, and it's nice, and it's thoughtful, and I save everything. Yeah. Time for about one more question. Yes? Um, since it sounds like your company is evolving and healthcare is always evolving, I was wondering if you've ever considered adding a pharmacist to your at home visiting staff to help improve your patient care. That's a good question. We haven't thought about a pharmacist. We have thought about a social worker to work with, um, with families. But pharmacy, we'll leave that kind of to CVS and to Walgreens uh, and to other doctors. But uh, not a pharmacist, but a, a therapist. That was a very good question, smart question. So. Yeah. Is that it? Well, yeah. Thank you. I just want to, uh, one last time, uh, again, you, you invested an hour of your time with me, and I know it's an hour that you won't get back in your life. I just hope that I was able to inspire you and motivate you and push you to do something different in your life, look at your life differently, expand your lens, expand your horizon. And of course, uh, we are in New Jersey, we are in Pennsylvania, we are now in New England. And if you are interested, you want to learn more, you want an intern, you want a, a potential job, uh, feel free to contact me directly if you're in the area. Uh, I always want to hire URI grads or URI students, whatever it may be. And again, I just want to, I want to thank you. And to me, being here today was, it was an honor. And you allowed me to check something off my bucket list. And I hope that this, this has inspired you to do the same. So thank you again, really. Jonathan, thank you so much. You are truly a remarkable person and an inspiration, as you can see, to everybody here. And you really unleashed and uncorked that passion for everybody in this audience today, too. You could see it in the wonderful questions that yeah. people asked. And we so appreciate you traveling all the way from New York to be here with us and to bring your lovely wife and your wonderful colleague as yeah. well. And we just have a, a small token of our appreciation. Oh. Um, first. We have a beautiful portfolio for you with the URI emblem on it for you. Thank and you. inside you'll see a Harrington School pen. Thank so you. So you can always remember when you're writing or correcting Thank that you. the Harrington School taught you about that. And Thanks. also, uh, the Harrington School. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Oh,
awesome. Thank you. It was awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Yeah. <laughs>